Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. Mike Riddle was a national champion in track and field in college, and later rose to the rank of captain in the United States Marine Corps. This background serves him well in the defense of biblical truth, and for 35 years he's been speaking to groups of all sizes defending the accuracy of the Bible. In 1 Peter 3, we're commanded to be able to defend what we believe in the Bible, be able to give a good answer when someone asks. And in this presentation, you're going to get a boatload of Bible-defending information from one of the top presenters in the nation. Enjoy this presentation, 10 Apologetics Questions Answered by Mike Riddle. Oorah, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, you all must be a bunch of sinners because you have to listen to me twice. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do something here uh, the way I normally like to teach because uh, I'm not going to breathe in order to finish this thing in about 50, 55 minutes. We're going to do a top 10 apologetics questions answered. And these are pretty much the top 10 questions we get asked all the time in this field. And we're going to show you how to uh, answer some of them. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, I want to talk about the principles of engagement. Now, I like to put things in military terms, so I'm going to expect you to sit up straight, pay attention, and not look like a Navy person. <laughs> now you know what branch in the military I was in. <laughs> but our principles of engagement are 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show ourselves approved. That doesn't mean watch television. Study. Second, have a ready answer. How often are we supposed to have that ready answer according to God's word? Always. These are biblical commands. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. This is the strategy I use in all my debates. Bring down strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And then once you've brought that stronghold down, you fill it with the gospel. And then we will go into battle with the full armor of God, not our wisdom. So those are the principles of engagement when you go into apologetics and you talk to other people. And we're going to use those. So let's go to challenge number one. This is the one that's used against our children most of the time. How do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? Well, so how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And the answer is, you don't. What, Mike? You mean they never existed? Yes, they did. Here's the problem. It's the wrong question. It's not a fitting things into the Bible. The Bible's already complete, so we're not supposed to add to it. See, the right question you should be asking if you really have a biblical worldview is, what does the Bible teach about dinosaurs? We've got to learn to start by asking the right question. We're asking questions like we're part of the world. Folks, the Bible has answers. So here's what the Bible says, and God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that grieveth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was Good. He did all that on day six. Notice what he created here. The cattle, the cream, things that go creepeth, aren't you glad he made those? And then the beast of the earth. Now, wait a minute. Who or what were those beasts of the earth? Well, they might have been the things like the lions, the tigers, the giraffes, the hippopotamus, the second graders, and the dinosaurs. <laughs> Do I get agreement on that one? <laughs> yes. But notice right here, on day six of creation, the same day he created Adam and Eve, he created land animals. What were dinosaurs? Land animals. See, there's your answer right there in Genesis chapter 1. People miss that. Right there in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible teaches dinosaurs and people lived at the same time. Wow. Well, let's look at another place in the Bible. Job chapter 40, verses 15 through 18. A very strange creature here. God is describing to Job. Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, eats grass as an ox. This creature is being described as a plant eater, eating grass. You know what that means? It's not an alligator, because what do alligators eat? Us. <laughs> so it's not an alligator. Then God says he moves his tail like a cedar. A cedar is a large tree, so we've got a plant eater with a big tail. And then his bones are as strong as pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. We got a plant eater with a big tail and big bones. And God says he is the chief of the ways of God. Maybe indicating this is one of the largest creatures he ever made. So let's examine that. There's a big tail. Are we talking about an elephant there? 
Absolutely not. <laughs> Most Bibles, when you go down to the bottom of the page and read the commentary, and I want you to understand the commentary is not the inspired word of God, we'll call this creature hippopotamus. I think that's an embarrassment, because what kind of a tail hippopotamus have? It's got a twig back there. It doesn't have a big tail. We believe God is describing a creature that looks something like this. Now, we don't know how happy it was, but the description resembles this. And we don't know for sure it was a dinosaur, because we weren't there. But the description in God's Word in Job chapter 40 exactly resembles that of a dinosaur and no other creature. It is certainly not a hippopotamus or an elephant or an alligator. And day six of creation, what did God create? Land animals, which were dinosaurs. Now, what evidence is there that dinosaurs and people lived at the same time? Let's look at the scientific evidence. Well, first we need to understand, we didn't know much about dinosaurs until the 1800s. We had found bones, but we didn't know what they were until the 1800s. So any ideas or sightings or drawings of dinosaur-like creatures before the 1800s could be good information, good evidence. People saw them living. And is the word dinosaur in the Bible? And we said no. Why not? It wasn't invented until 1841. Do we see the word computer in the Bible? No, because they're not going to be in heaven. How many say amen to that one? (laughs) Yes. God doesn't need computers. He doesn't crash, and he knows it all. Well, let's take a look at the evidence of dinosaurs and people. There's a drawing we find on canyon walls. Does that look like a giraffe? No, it doesn't look like any creature living today, but that picture is well old, much older than the 1800s. That picture exactly resembles a dinosaur, nor the creature living today. There's another picture of a cave drawing. We call these petroglyphs. We find these all over the world, and they exactly resemble dinosaurs. How did they know to draw all these if they never saw one living? There's one in Arizona. Again, that's not a giraffe. That exactly resembles a dinosaur. And there's one in Utah. Somebody had to see something, or these people all over the world had the same great imagination. Have you been to northern England? Nobody? Then I can say anything I want. (laughs) Okay, northern England. There's a large cathedral there called the Carlisle Cathedral. Now, I'm going to test your history here. This cathedral was built in the 1200s. Is that before the 1800s? Yes. See, you passed my history test already. Now, you go into that cathedral. There's a large center aisle, just like we have a center aisle here, a large center aisle. And then in that center aisle, there's a carpet there. And under that carpet is buried Bishop Bell. He was buried there in 1496, and that is also before the 1800s. 1496. You lift that carpet up, and going around his tomb there is a large brass ring about this size. And carved into that brass ring are pictures of animals and dinosaurs. Wow. See, the evidence is already mounting just by this, that people saw dinosaurs alive. And this whole evolution idea, they died out 65 million years ago, is simply not true. It's not founded on any observable evidence. It's just a story. Then we go down to Cambodia, over to Cambodia. And there's some ruins dating from the 1200 A.D. time frame. And that man is pointing to a very significant figure there. Carved into that wall is a picture of a stegosaurus. That's a very unique creature. How did they know to draw that one? if they never saw one alive. And man, we didn't know what the bones look, these dinosaurs looked like until the 1800s. I believe people saw them. I think the evidence is overwhelming. Then recently, some scientists were out looking for bones, and they found some T-Rex bones in this country. And they were rather heavy, so they had to cut the bones to get them out of there. And when they cut those bones and took them to the lab, something amazing was discovered. Still on these Tyrannosaurus rex bones was soft, elastic tissue. So soft and elastic, you could actually stretch this tissue and it would come back together again. Let me show you some pictures. Here's actual pictures of this soft tissue. It looks a little bit like chocolate pudding, doesn't it? (laughs) There goes your eating chocolate pudding. (laughs) Now, let me show you some more pictures of this. You can actually squeeze this tissue and squeeze out microscopic structures. Now, what have the evolutionists had to say about this? Well, their first story was this. 
there's some unknown process that preserves soft tissue for 70 million years. <laughs> then they tried to back out of it and say, oh, it's really not dinosaur tissue. It's some kind of microbe in there. But now they've refuted that and said, this is not microbe. And if it was microbe, so what? That can't last for 70 million years either. No matter what they say, there's no known process that can preserve soft tissue for 70 million years, folks. This is very strong evidence people and dinosaurs lived at the same time. This whole idea of a meteor came down 65 million years ago and killed all the dinosaurs is a story. We have no clue what a meteor would do around this world. No one's ever seen it. So dinosaurs, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? You don't, you don't right. It's what does the Bible teach about dinosaurs? And we saw that in Genesis chapter 1, and we saw it in the book of Job, chapter 40 there. The Bible does teach a little bit about dinosaurs. So that's number one. Challenge number two. Where did Cain get his wife? I get this one a lot. We get a lot of answers in Genesis. Where did Cain get his wife? And I talk to people saying, you know, I got that question last week. I didn't know what to do. So where did Cain get his wife? Well, we got Adam and Eve. That's the best picture we can come up with. <laughs> and we got Cain, Abel, and Seth. Who did Cain marry? Well, the first part of this answer is in the Bible. We'll go to the Bible first. And it says of Adam and Eve, they had other sons and daughters. What is that implying? Oh, my, are you trying to say Cain married his sister? Yes. Oh, but Mike, you can't do that. That's against the law today. It's called incest. Well, there's two reasons you won't marry your brother or sister today. Number one is it is against the law. Number two, you probably don't like them that much. But I'm not going to talk about that one. But let's talk about this thing, incest. What is incest? Marrying your close relation. Why don't, we allow, why don't we allow people to do that today? It's called mutations. We all have a tremendous genetic load of mutations in us. Just look at that person next to you. <laughs> going to get a little fight going on here. <laughs> Matter of fact, the geneticists tell us every new generation is getting about 100 more mutations, which means which direction are we really going? Downhill. We're going downhill. So, yes, Cain married his sister, most likely, or very close relation. But wait a minute, Mike, what about mutations? Well, what do mutations do to us? They take us down. There's no known beneficial mutation that has added information. We don't know of any. We're going to cover that in the talks here tonight. You see, if you both, husband and wife, share the same genetic mutation, there's a high probability that children will be deformed. So we don't want you marrying your close relation to protect the children. That's what we're doing. That's why we do that. But let's go back to the Bible now. Genesis chapter 1. God finishes his six-day creation, and what does he say? It is very good. He calls his creation perfect, meaning there are no mutations. Everything is just perfect. And then comes sin, and God places a curse. And it wasn't until the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, almost 2,500 years after creation, that God, not man, but God makes the rule, no longer can you marry your close relation. Why? Because we've just had 2,500 years of accumulating mutations due to sin. So in the first part of that, it was okay to marry your brother or sister because we didn't have the tremendous genetic load of mutations. So it was not incest back then. It was perfectly fine to do that. And the children come out just fine. But because of sin, because of mutations, God said no more in the book of Leviticus. So when somebody says the Bible's teaching incest, they haven't read the Bible, or they're not believing what the Bible teaches. So the answer, where did Cain get his wife? He married his sister, and that was perfectly okay. It is not incest. We can't do it today because we have mutations. So let's go to challenge three. Does God really exist? Now, I can only spend a little bit of time on this, but if you want the full one on how to talk to a non-believer, it's on this DVD, Four Power Questions. Even as I go through the whole thing of the existence of God. But let's take a, look, a cursory look here. Stone tools. When scientists come across tools like this, they start salivating. Why? Because some intelligence must have created these. These are just stone tools, incidentally. And they start thinking, intelligence. People must have done these. 
So I want to show you what millions of years of wind can do, according to evolution. Get a little more wind, get a little more wind, <laughs> a little more wind. <laughs> that certainly couldn't have taken any intelligence to do that. All it takes is millions of years, a little bit of weather. But see, we laugh at that, but that is the actual teaching they do in public schools. That is exactly what they're teaching our youth. Anybody recognize anything about these? They're machines. But you know, every one of those machines had an intelligent designer. And some of you may question that computer, but yes, they did. They were all intelligently designed with a purpose in mind. Now, you also recognize things called motors. We all know about motors. We use them. And I know all you women out there like motors, because if you didn't, we wouldn't have hair dryers. But I want to show you a very super fast motor. This is a pretty fast motor. How fast is this motor? It can do up to 17,000 rotations per minute. That is a very fast motor. Wow, what company has this? It's also a very small motor. How big are these motors? About 30 nanometers in diameter. In other words, you can put 25 million of them on one inch. That's a pretty small, what company did this? Well, let me talk about that. This is what it looks like. It's got a motor complex, protein export systems, rings, rods, hooks, and filaments, and many other components in there. Every one of those components is necessary. This motor doesn't work. It's called a flagellum. And you all have these in you. Now, I want to talk about speed of this flagellum. Who's the fastest runner here? Now, we're going to measure this in, measure in terms of body lengths per second. Which is the fastest one? We've got a cheetah. We can go up to 60-plus miles per hour. We've got Usain Bolt, which, who runs the fastest 100 meters ever run by anybody ever seen there. Then we've got a bacteria flagella. Which is the fastest? Flagella. It can go up to 50 body lengths in one second. The cheetah can only accumulate, go about 25 body lengths in a second. So in terms of body lengths, the flagella is by far the fastest. So where is this motor found? Inside cells. Who made it? See, this goes beyond any technology mankind has ever made. We can't make anything that small that works like that. It's beyond anything mankind has ever made. Right there is testimony that there had to be a creator God. Romans 1, 19 and 20 tells us God has given us all the evidence, and there's no excuse. So all we have to do is look at the tiny little motors inside our bodies. Then we look at things like the human eye. Our eyes blink about 400 million times in a lifetime. You can see millions of shades of colors, and it's beyond anything our best science can do. You know, the evolutionists are out there saying, oh, the eye's a bad example. You know, my response is, build a better one. <laughs> They've never taken up that challenge because they can't. It's a perfectly designed instrument there. I would call that design because it goes beyond any technology mankind can do today. That means whoever put that eye there has to be smarter than any man's ever li lived there. And you read the Bible. He that formed the eye, shall he not see? Then we look at our human ear. Well, you may not want to look at the ear of the person next to you. Tiny, millions of tiny moving parts. Matter of fact, the smallest bones in your body are in the air. It contains parts for hearing and helping us keep balance. It contains over 100,000 tiny hair cells that keep our balance and direction. That's how you keep your balance. So keep your fingers out of your ears. It's more advanced than our best science. Our scientists can't even come close to what an ear does. Let me show you some things about an ear. Three major parts. We have an outer part of the ear which catches the sound waves, just like you're doing right now. My sound waves are like sine waves coming, and your outer ear is catching them. Then you move into the middle part of the ear where we find the smallest bones in the body, and we find the eardrum, which amplifies that sound as it comes in. Then the most incredible part of the ear is the inner part, the inner part. In the inner ear, we have these fluids and tiny little hairs. But here's what happens that beats any technology we can do. It actually takes the sound waves and converts those sound waves into electrical pulses and sends them to the brain. We can't do things like that. But yet, your body does it all the time. That's amazing. It's more complex than anything mankind has ever, ever designed. So the only alternative is, whoever made that ear has got to be smarter than anybody's ever lived, and I would call that evidence for a creator. Proverbs 20, verse 12, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. I wish some of those people out there believe in evolution or theistic evolution, trying to say God used evolution, would read that. 
Then we look at our blood vessels. We contain over 1,500 miles of blood vessels. In other words, you stretch yourself out, you can go from Seattle to San Diego. You're pretty tall now, aren't you? But that's only a little bit. Did you know you actually have about 40 billion capillaries extending 25,000 miles inside you? That's a lot of spaghetti. Aren't you glad they put it in the right place? So I don't think that can happen by random chance. That's a lot of spaghetti inside you. That would take a tremendous design to get all that just right. 40 billion capillaries. I would call that a design, purposeful design. Then we look at our brain. 100 billion neurons, nerve cells. Each neuron is connected to thousands of other neurons by synapsis. That's, that's the fancy word for connection. So the real superhighway, there are 5,000 million, million, million possible pathways for linking all your cells in there. That's called 5 sextillion possible pathways. That makes the internet look pretty sad, doesn't it? Your brain, computer versus our brain in storage capacity. There's a 340 gigabytes. That's a pretty good size hard drive in some of these computers today, but your brain can store about a quadrillion pieces of information. Wouldn't it be nice if we could retrieve all that? <laughs> the real super speed, starting from a single cell when you're at conception, on average, 250,000 connections or neurons are formed every minute for nine months. That's the average. That's incredible speed. Think of the baby inside the mother's womb, what's happening now. Real super speed. It is estimated the brain can perform 1,000 million million computations a second. That's about a quadrillion computation a second. So why does it take you so long to do your math? Now you don't have many excuses left, do you? I call that a purposeful design, not random chance. Question, challenge number four. This one comes from within the church, the very popular one in the church. Hasn't evolution been proven? Yes, that comes within the church. It also comes from within secular schools. Isn't that a shame that has to come from within churches? We just did a poll of Michigan University, Christian universities in Michigan. You know what we found out? Every one of them teaches evolution. That's sad, what's happened to our Christian universities. Well, let me show you. This is an easy one to do. Has evolution been proven, proven true? When we look at the origin of matter, where did this universe come from? The evolutionists only have speculation. They weren't there, were they? But you know, the Bible says so. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the Bible gives us an answer. God created the universe. He created all the matter and energy. Evolutionists have to assume somehow it got here. We look at the origin of life. All we can find in every textbook is, well, we don't know, but we're trying to figure it out. The Bible tells us, in the beginning, God created all things. Look at the origin of humans. It's all speculation, even the latest one, Artie. Incidentally, if you have heard about Artie, Artie was actually found in the mid-1990s and was discredited back then. They're just resurrecting it because they don't have anything new. <laughs> Genesis 1 through 11 tells us, we were made in the image and likeness of God and we're fearfully wonderfully made. Evolution is just speculation, finding old bones, trying to put them together, and then speculating what they look like by going out and hiring artists. The origin of dinosaurs, this is the big one. The question we normally ask is, what happened to the dinosaurs? The important question is, where did they come from? I've been in museums all over the world. You know what I see? Dinosaur bones. What am I not seeing? All the hundreds of thousands of creatures that evolved up to the dinosaurs. Why are they not in the museums? Because they can't find them. Why can't they find them? That's easy. They never existed. See, it's so easy, isn't it? I do nothing but easy stuff up here. Origin of stars. The evolutionists have to do speculation. Why? They've never seen one come into existence. They have to speculate. But God teaches the answer right on day four of creation. And he says, oh, he made the stars also. It was so easy for him. We've never seen a star form. And based on the laws of physics, we don't have a clue how they would form. Because they can't, based on physics. And we're going to talk about that when the talk later tonight. Fossil record. Where are the millions and millions of transitional forms? There aren't any, but the Bible says God created everything after its kind. You see, has evolution been proven true? Absolutely not. It is based on speculation, human speculation. Challenge five. Oh, my, but God could have used evolution, couldn't he? He could have used evolution. That would solve everything. That would make your lives much easier. Then you don't have to listen to people like me. God uses evolution. I can believe the Bible. I can believe in evolution. And we'll all live in harmony. 
know, if a Christian's asking that question, first thing that comes to my mind is, have they ever read the Bible? It's the wrong question to be asking. See, it's not a matter of what God could have done. It's a matter of what did he do, and it's in the Bible. So as Christians, we're not even asking the right questions. We're asking questions like we're entrenched in the world and not in God's word. So let's look at this. Did God use evolution? I want to solve this, this puzzle here. It's really not a puzzle. I want to look at three things that affect everything, the Bible, if God used evolution. Number one, we'll look at how does it affect the character of God if he used evolution. Number two, how does it affect the authority of Scripture? And number three, logic. How many like logic here? Can I know? Well, let me rephrase this. Logic comes from God. How many like logic? <laughs> so I could have been a politician, persuade you to do anything. Okay, millions of years, what does it mean? If God used evolution, then we're saying it took millions and billions of years to do this. Now, look at this picture. There's two children standing there in the grass, and what's underneath them? A record of dead things, fossils. So if God used evolution, what are we talking about? All these dead things happened before sin. Because that's what the fossil record would be. Millions and millions of years of dead things before Adam and Eve. That's what millions of years means, folks. You've just undermined the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's serious now. The character of God. Well, let's read this. Deuteronomy chapter 32. He is the rock. His work is perfect. Anybody believe that? Okay, we believe his works are perfect. Then we go to Psalm 18. As for God, his way is perfect. So his works are perfect. His ways are perfect. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He is perfect. His works are perfect. His ways are perfect. Okay, that's pretty easy to understand. We don't have a problem with that. Let's go to Genesis then. And God saw everything that he made. Behold, it was very good. Now we just saw his ways and his works is, are perfect, and he is perfect. And now we're talking about his works from creation. What does very good mean? Does it mean millions of years of death and decay, or does it mean perfect? You see, if you're believing in billions of years, you're taking the, the death and decay before sin. This age of the earth is very important, what we believe. It is not a side issue. It will affect your belief in the character of God. Let's look at the authority of Scripture then. How does it affect the authority of Scripture? And the Bible says, evening and morning were the first day. In other words, God is defining the length of his days in Genesis chapter 1. He says, the evening and morning. Everywhere in the Old Testament we see the phrase evening and morning, it always means a day. It never means millions of years. Then God writes down on the stone tablets, Ten Commandments, Commandment number four, four and six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all is in them. So God defined the days in Genesis, then he wrote down in the Ten Commandments, unless we don't want to believe the Ten Commandments anymore. See, if commandment number four doesn't mean what it says, then how do we trust the other nine? We might just as well get rid of them, folks. You see, once you compromise Genesis, you just compromise the Ten Commandments. And it's going to get worse. In Mark 10, verse 6, the Gospel of Mark Jesus Christ makes this statement. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. What is Jesus saying there? Jesus is saying that man and woman were on this planet from the beginning of the creation, not after millions of years. So here's the problem. You believe in millions of years? You're teaching death before sin? You're throwing away the Ten Commandments? And you've just said the words of Jesus Christ are not correct anymore. And if Jesus is not correct, then maybe he's not God. If he's not God, he's not our Savior. Do you see what the age of the earth really means now? And we've been duped into believing it's not an important issue. Let's go to logic. We all agreed we like logic. Did God use evolution? Well, let's start here. Can two opposites both be true? No, the law of non-contradiction basically says two opposites cannot be both, both be true at the same time. So let's look at this. The Bible teaches God created the earth first, then the stars. Evolution teaches stars evolved first, then the earth. Can they both be true? No. Does that settle it right there? See how easy that was? Right there in Genesis chapter 1, you get the answer, did God use evolution? It says no right there. Let's look at a few more. The Bible teaches God created the birds on day 5 and the reptiles, which are land animals, on day 6. Birds first and reptiles. Evolution worldview teaches reptiles first, and they evolved into birds. They both can't be true. The Bible teaches God formed this earth out of a watery mass. Evolution teaches it came out of a molten mass. They both can't be true. The Bible teaches God created land plants first, then the sun. 
Evolution teaches the sun came first, then land plants. Incidentally, for people who want to believe the days of creation were long periods of time, here's a big problem we've got to get around. If the days of creation reached millions of years long, he created the plants on day three and the sun on day four. That means we had millions of years of plants with no sun. See, that's very unscientific. And then finally, the Bible teaches man first, then death. Evolution teaches death first, then man. See, this whole thing of God used evolution is a problem. So did God use evolution? Belief in evolution in billions of years changes the character of God. His very good now becomes death, decay, disease, and destruction. A belief in billions of years puts man's wisdom above God's word. And believing God used evolution is illogical and elevates man's wisdom above God's word. So it comes down to this. Which one's your authority? Man's opinion or God's word? Which one are you willing to start with? Folks, it doesn't matter if two-thirds or nine-tenths of the scientists on this planet believe in evolution. That doesn't change truth. You know, one time, most of the scientists out there, evolutionary scientists, believed in somebody called Piltdown Man. Guess what? They were all wrong. You see, truth is not measured by quantity and numbers. So challenge six. Was there really a worldwide flood? Well, let's answer this one. Let's start with fossils. We all know there's billions and billions and billions of fossils out there. There's two stories about those fossils. Number one, the Genesis flood in the Bible. And secondly, there's millions of years in evolution. Those are the two stories we have, how the fossils got there. Well, let's look at this. What happens to fish when they die? Do they sink to the bottom, slowly get buried, and become a fossil? That's wrong. Anybody have a fish pet at home? When they die, what happens to them? They float. They float. They don't sink to the bottom. They float, and usually the, the oxygen, they all get scavenged away, and they decay away. And they don't become a fossil. So a fish float when they die, get scavenged away. So a fish float when they die, why do we have so many fish fossils? There shouldn't be there, should they? According to evolution, over long, slow periods of time, when these sea creatures die, they should all float, get scavenged away. We shouldn't have any fish fossils hardly out there. But yeah, we have... Billions and billions and billions of fish fossils out there. Well, let's look at this. What would a worldwide flood do? Let's think for a moment. It probably would bury billions of dead things in rock layers all over the world. Now, this is not a tranquil flood. We have the waters swishing back and forth, great tsunamis going on, moving tremendous amounts of layers of dirt all over the planet. So that's what we believe would happen if we had a worldwide flood. Now, we didn't see it, but that's what we believe would happen. You know what we actually find all over the world? This might surprise you. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. You know, most all the fossils we find are in sedimentary rock, which is what? Rock laid down by water. Isn't that amazing? You know what we find on top of Mount Everest? Seashells. We find seashells on top of just about every mountain range on this planet. You know what we don't find with those seashells? Legs. That means they did not walk up there. <laughs> See how simple this is? <laughs> I want to talk about fossil graveyards. These are graveyards where we find them all over the world, where we find hundreds to thousands of creatures all buried together. I'm going to show you a couple of these. Here's Nebraska, a fossil graveyard of about 9,000 animals, rhinos, horses, camels, giant wild boars, birds, plants, trees, and seashells and fish. All buried and mangled together, 9,000 animals. Y you think this happened? Th this, this, let's see if check this scenario. There's a rhinoceros over there. I can be a seashell. I'm going to grow some legs, walk over there, and wait for myself to die. Now I want to be buried in this graveyard. Anybody think they did that? No. In order to get this, you have to have some catastrophic event that will move all these creatures together. This is not long, slow processes. Then we go to Wyoming, dinosaur graveyard, seven miles long, 483 dinosaurs have been discovered there so far. Now, I don't think these dinosaurs said, well, that's my family graveyard over there. I'm going to go over here and wait until I die and just become a fossil. That doesn't happen. To become a fossil, you must be buried rapidly to keep the sediments, uh, keep the oxygen away and keep the scavengers away. Here's one in Utah, over 12,000 bones of 70 different animals and 10 different kinds of dinosaurs all buried together. Did we ever see this in our textbooks or news? No, they don't talk about things like this because it's pretty hard to explain by long, slow processes. 
Here's uh, Siberia, graveyard of bears, wolf, fox, badger, saber-toothed cats, jaguar, lynx, and so on. Many different kinds of creatures all buried together. In Utah, one of the largest fossil graveyards in the world, over 1,600 fossilized dinosaur bones are buried there. This is not a testimony to Darwinian evolution at all. This is a testimony to a tremendous catastrophic event. Then we go to the Gobi Desert. Guess what we found in the Gobi Desert? A dinosaur graveyard. We find them all over the world. So when we look at this, what do, dinos- what do graveyards tell us? Something had to be buried fast. And it had to be something very large because we find these all over the world. So I believe dinosaur graveyards and gra- fossil graveyards are a testimony to a worldwide flood, not Darwinian evolution. Challenge number seven. Does the, ooh, now we're getting into cosmology. Does the Big Bang fit with the Bible? Now this one's important because why? We have a lot of our, some of our leading theologians out there believing in the Big Bang. I won't name any here. But if you want to talk to me later, I'll tell you some of the popular ones out there do believe in the Big Bang. I can only cover so much, but I'll let you know. If you want more information, it's in our Red Answers book. So let's compare the Bible to the Big Bang cosmology, because that's it. Did God use the Big Bang as part of his creative process? What does the Bible teach? God created the stars on day four. What does evolution teach? Stars evolve by natural processes. Now, which one is it? The Bible teaches God made the stars. Evolution says, no, he didn't. They evolved by natural processes. We've got a conflict right there. Again, the Bible teaches the earth came first, then the stars. Evolution teaches stars, then the earth. We have a conflict with that in the Bible then. The Bible teaches sin before death. Big Bang cosmology teaches millions and millions of years. What would that include? Death before sin. Big Bang cosmology, again, Mark 10, verse 6. What does this teach? But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. In other words, man and woman are on the planet from the beginning of creation, not after millions and billions of years of stellar evolution. So when we look at the contradictions between these two, they both can't be true. But yet we have these theologians out there making these claims that God used the Big Bang. Well, let me show you some problems with the Big Bang cosmology here. There's many, many scientific problems. I'm going to cover a few. Star formation. I'm going to cover that in more detail in the next talk there. Star formation. In other words, we don't have a clue how stars form. Spiral galaxies shouldn't be spiral galaxies. Our own Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. It shouldn't be. Because after a few rotations, several hundred million years, all the spirals in the galaxies should be gone. So why are we seeing spiral galaxies out there that are billions of years old? They shouldn't be there. Big Bang cosmology does not predict what we're seeing. Recession of the moon. Anybody worried about that? The moon is receding from us about four centimeters a year. That bother anybody? That's about a little over two inches, about two inches a year. Uh, it's not a big problem until you start talking about several million or billion years. See, the evolutionists teach the moon is about four and a half billion years old, same age as the earth. But you go back about 1.4 billion years based on the recession we have there of the moon from the earth, the moon's in contact with the earth. So the numbers don't add up for the evolutionist. Supernova remnants, these are stars that explode. We don't see near enough for billions of years. We only see enough supernova remnants for about 6,000 years out there. That doesn't get taught in our classes either. If the universe was billions of years old, we should see thousands and thousands of supernovas. But we don't. We only see enough for about 6,000 years. Comets, what are comets? Great big dirty ice cubes that rotate around our solar system. Have a small little center mass there. You know what happens every time a comet circles around our sun? loses some of its mass. If our solar system is four and a half billion years old, we should have no comets. They should have all been gone a long time ago. So what do the evolutionists do? Well, first of all, they talk about something called the Kuiper Belt, which is out around uh, Neptune. There is a, r- a, comp- a ring of objects out there. And they tell us every once in a while, one of these objects comes out of that rotation there and starts circling around as, as a comet would around our solar system. That's, that's a nice try, but there's a great problem with that. No one's ever observed that happening. And secondly, all those objects are so big, they're about 10 times the biggest comet we have ever observed. So if one of those objects was to come out of that circular orbit and become a comet and come by our planet, it would be a sensational event. We've never seen anything like that. These are all at least 10 times bigger than the biggest comet we've ever seen. So that doesn't work. So what do they do next? They invent something else. They call it the Oort cloud. And here's how they describe it. So far out there, nobody can see this is large cloud 
of debris. Notice how they bury all that. And every once in a while, one of these objects comes in and starts circling around our solar system. Well, one, it's never been observed. It's nothing but speculation. In other words, the evolutionists are basing their whole idea here on speculation. But it's being passed off as truth in our classes. Missing antimatter. We can't find the, all the antimatter. Yes, there is antimatter, and we can't find it. See, if there's, we went through a big bang explosion, there should be equal amounts of matter and antimatter. We don't find near enough antimatter anywhere in the universe. That's a problem with Big Bang cosmology. And we have missing population three stars. That's based on stars exploding and then forming together to form another population of stars which explode and become another population of stars over time. We don't find them because we can't find the right elements out there. Those are just some of the scientific problems of Big Bang cosmology can't be answered. See, none of this gets taught to our students, though. Then there are many, many scientists that do not believe in the Big Bang cosmology. I just listed some of the physicists and astronomers. There are literally thousands of PhD scientists that do not believe in the Big Bang out there because it just is not very scientific. Then we have the conclusion. Big Bang cosmology, folks, is simply not compatible with the Bible. It is not compatible with the Bible. We saw God's order of events is very different. So let's do challenge eight. Ooh, wow, Mike, now you're really stepping on a tough one. Distant starlight. Let me explain this. Number eight, distant starlight. If we're saying the earth is only about 8,000 years old, the whole creation is only about 6,000 years old, and these galaxies are millions and millions of light years away, how in the world can we see that light in only 6,000 years? Hmm. That's a tough one, isn't it? If everything is only 6,000 years old, there has not been enough time for that light to travel those millions of years, millions of light years. Well, I want to show you a technique here. I use this all the time because when I get into the science and I start talking to people about the science of this, we get very glazed over. We're going to try and stay away from that for a little bit. If you want more, I'll talk about that later. But the best way to do this is use the best teacher there ever was. His name is called Jesus Christ. Let's use his method. In Matthew 21, verse 23, Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching, and he said... By what, and they said, and by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? They challenged Jesus. By what authority are you doing this? Well, how did Jesus answer? But Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. What did he just do there? He just turned this whole thing around. You see, this is what's happening in evolution. We're being challenged all the time, but... They're ignoring their own problems, which are bigger than ours. So problems with evolution and distant starlight. I want to show you some of the problems, first of all. First of all, the origin of stars. This is how I answer the question. Somebody says, Mike, distant, distant starlight, how are you going to solve that problem? Well, here's my answer. If you would tell me where the stars came from, especially the first star, then I'll tell you how the light got here. Because if you don't have any stars, then you don't have any light to get here, do you? First, tell me how your stars got here. Then I will tell you how the light got here. Isn't that what Jesus just did? See, if we don't do that, we're ignoring their problems. They have a big problem. Where do stars come from? They cannot answer that. Second, there's a horizon problem. They, have a, they actually have a bigger problem with distant starlight than we do as Christians. And then there's the assumption of materialism, which is easy, easy to override. It's called information. So distant starlight, we have some possible solutions. The speed of light, has it always been a constant? Well, we don't know for sure. We believe it's always been a constant, but we can't confirm that. The assumption of time is a constant. You know time is not a constant? What? You're talking about going back in time? No, no, no. But time is variable. It goes at different speeds. Didn't you just see me turn around? I turned around so fast you didn't see it. No. <laughs> It works for my four-year-olds. <laughs> <Grand. laughs> now, time is, is um, changed by the effects of gravity. Gravity does affect time. And then there's different time zones. You know, a couple weeks ago, I left the city of Cincinnati and landed in Chicago before I left. Time-wise. Time-wise, yes. Took about 56 minutes to get there. <laughs> we went into a different time zone. There are scientists out there, many of them now believe that maybe space is divided into time zones, just like we are here on this planet. Those are some possible solutions to this. Are any of them true? We don't know. 
We don't know. They could all be true, parts of them true. We just don't know for sure. So when it comes to distant starlight, what we have to recognize is we have possible answers. We don't know if any of them are true, but the evolutionists must be held accountable. How do they explain their problem with distant starlight and their problem with where did the light givers come from called stars? Let's go to number nine now. Teaching about creation is too divisive. Well, that comes from a lot of our emerging churches today, uh, a lot of our seeker-friendly churches today. They don't want to talk about creation because it is divisive. But we have to understand they're being disobedient to God's word when they do that. They're not following the Bible anymore. They're following their own wisdom. Because the Bible teaches in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Not some of it. All of it. And that includes creation. And also the book of Numbers. How many have read the book of Numbers lately? <laughs> wow, pretty good. <laughs> now, Jesus drives out the money changers. Well, maybe he didn't quite do it. Maybe he said, let's all get together. Is that what he did? Let's all live in harmony. No, that's not what he did. What did Jesus do? He went in there and overturned some tables. That's not a very nice thing to do. Yes, it was. It was the right thing to do. Matthew 15, Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees. Said, well, what? He overturned tables. Now he's calling people names. Wow. What kind of person do we follow here? Let's see what happened. Then his disciples came and said to him, do you not know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Wow, the Pharisees were offended. What did Jesus say? But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. If the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. That sounds like the seeker-friendly churches, emergent church today, doesn't it? What does Jesus have to say about them? If that leadership doesn't change, they're going to they're be in deep trouble. The rich young ruler came to Jesus. What must I do to be saved? And Jesus answered and said, well, you've got to sell everything. You've got to give everything. And the rich young ruler just couldn't do that. So what did he do? He started walking away. And what did Jesus do? Jesus said, I didn't mean it. How about just half of it? <laughs> it's not what Jesus did. You see, Jesus demands everything. Are you willing to give everything? And the rich young ruler was not. Not that he's going to take everything, but he's asking you, are you willing to give it all? And only you can answer that question to yourselves. How much are you willing to give back to Jesus? Part of it or all of it? How much do you really love God? See, Jesus loved these people so much, he would not compromise the word. He was interested in their eternal salvation, not in making them feel good here. How much are we willing to go out to the other person and tell them the truth, even if it hurts about God's word? Even if they might call us names. You know, I've been called more names, worse names, doing this than I was in the Marine Corps. You can imagine what that was like. <laughs> You know how important the first three chapters of Genesis are? Because of what happened in the first three chapters of Genesis, the whole rest of the Bible had to take place. The whole Bible rests on what happened in those first three chapters of Genesis. What do we learn there? Original relationship with God. Why we have death. It's because of sin. Why we need a Savior. And why God will have to make everything new. In other words, you give up those first three chapters, you have what's called a cut and paste theology. You make the Bible mean anything you want. And that's what's happening in a lot of our churches today. Many churches believe they can be neutral. Ah, now I've given you an out. Maybe you haven't decided what you want to believe on this yet. So what you're going to do is be neutral. Just be neutral. Sounds good. You know what neutrality is when it comes to God's word? It's called surrender. You blend in with the world. You can hang a sign out there, First Church of Lukewarm. <laughs> That's what neutrality means when it comes to God's word. Jesus had something important to say about neutrality. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Jesus did not accept neutrality. We are to study and rightfully handle the word of God. There are no excuses. But let's do the fast, last one quickly. Why does a good God allow death and suffering? Now I'm going to answer this two different ways. Once this, in this talk to the believer, and in the next talk at 7 o'clock, I'm going to show you how to answer that to the non-believer. Because this is a very good question. I've had to answer this question to a lot of non-believers because it is a stumbling block. And it wouldn't be nice if we had those answers. So why does a good God allow death and suffering? How do you answer to the believer? 
Well, this is what I see in a lot of church bulletins. This is what I hear from a lot of people in church. We can't know the mind of God. We just need to trust him. Well, that's correct, but it's not a complete answer. It's not a complete answer. Why does a good God allow death and suffering? Your answer to suffering death depends on what you believe about Genesis 1 through 11. What? Yes, it does. It depends on what you believe about the age of the earth. Yes, it does. How you answer a believer about death and suffering depends on what you believe about Genesis 1 through 11, the age of the earth. This is a very important issue. You see, the Bible teaches this. Then in Genesis 2, 17, you will surely die if you eat of the tree of this life. And you will die if you eat of this, being both physical and spiritual. Romans 5, 12 says death came through one man. Romans 8, 20 through 22 teaches all creation growth. All creation is in decay because of what? Sin. The Bible clearly teaches we have death because of sin. But if you're believing in millions of years, then you're believing in millions of years of death, pain, killing, disease, thorns, thistles, and all that before sin. That means sin is not the cause of death. Wait a minute. That goes against the New Testament then, doesn't it? If sin is not the cause of death, let's take, go back to the garden now. What, who is or what is? Going back to the garden. After the fall, God approaches Adam. And what does Adam say? God, is not my fault. It's that, what's that word? Woman, you gave me. Yes. Now, let's analyze that. What did Adam just do? Adam did not accept accountability for what he did. He blamed God for this, didn't he? So now God goes over to Eve, and what does Eve say? God, it's not my fault. It's that serpent you made. What did Eve do? She did not accept accountability. She blamed God. Folks, if you're believing in millions of years, then it's not sin that caused death. Who or what is it? You're blaming God, aren't you? Do you see what happens when we go away from the Word of God? When we try and change God's Word because of popular beliefs? The Bible clearly says God created in six days. He defined those days for us, evening and morning. He wrote it down in the Ten Commandments. And I'll let you know, the scientific evidence clearly does support a young earth. We've got the information back there. So coming to grips with Genesis, John MacArthur writes, Christians should not be intimidated by dogmatic naturalism. We do not need to invent a new interpretation of Genesis every time some geologist or astronomer declares that the universe must be older than previously thought. And he continues, Nor should we imagine that legitimate science poses any threat to the truth of Scripture. That is precisely what Paul was warning Timothy about. Folks, God created all the science. It will not contradict his word. It's man's misuse of science. And what did Paul tell Timothy in 6, 20 through 21? Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Doesn't that sound like a lot of people in church today? Whatever man comes up with, new idea, they immediately adopt that and abandon God's word. So thank you very much. I'll see you again at 7. This has been Top 10 Apologetics Questions Answered, presented by Mike Riddle. To receive a free catalog of over 200 awesome Bible studies on DVD or CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 24 hours a day, or visit us on the web at compass.org.